So thank, thank you, everybody, for coming to this session. Uh, I'll say it again. Um, if you're here for the migration session, that's not here. <laughs> or this is not the type of migration um, that you might be looking for. It's more, um, um, the session is going to be more of a philosoph philosophical ramblings. Uh, and like all the things that I've been learning to build a better business strategy for, for our company and how that reflects on the Drupal community and what it has, has taught me about um, different communities. Um, but uh, um, before I get started, I want to say thank you. Um, because I'm here after two weeks away from home, like I was one night at home. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and then my kids had to miss me already immediately again. Um, also, my wife is, um, is in Seget. Uh, she's not here. Uh, and I can only be here because they're there and, and um, they're taking care of each other without me. And uh, I, I think I, I should say thank you for that. The same way, I, I, I want to say thank you to Peter, who's my co-founder, <laughs> um, together with Laura, Laura, my wife, who's also a co-founder. Um, because Peter has been uh, very patient <laughs> while <laughs> I do all this kind of stuff and, and I come with all these crazy ideas that I want to go and change uh, best practices and completely ignore <laughs> um, <laughs> things that other people would say that are like basic best practices and standards and uh, there's a lot of philosophical ramblings uh, that we, we have. Um, and there's also uh, a, a whole big team of people um, that are providing for the work and the money uh, to be able to do this kind of stuff that um, made it possible for us, for Pronovix to be a sponsor here also. Uh, and I want to say thanks for that. Uh, and then last but not least, um, there's a the community because a lot of the things that I've learned, um, like these are not my ideas. Um, I've made them my own, but originally they come from a bunch of other people. Um, uh, including scientists and authors, uh, but also people from the Drupal community and from other open source uh, communities uh, out there in the world. Uh, and you for being here in the morning. It's not that early, but it still is the first session <laughs> on a Saturday after maybe a heavy night of drinking, although maybe the rain uh, helped uh, this year. <laughs> didn't, okay. Uh, so, um, um, but like, uh, Let's, with that in pre-introduction, our first introduction. What is this session about? Because bringing back abundance, why Drupal should be teal, those are a lot of um, weird words. <laughs> uh, or words that you might not be expecting in combination with, with Drupal necessarily. Like what does abundance have to do with Drupal community? Um, probably you can imagine something, but, and then teal, isn't that a color? Um, uh, probably, uh, who, who knew about steel before? Holacracy? Oh my god, wow. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, but basically, the session is going to be about why has Drupal been successful? And it's very easy to just forget about that question and just take it for granted. But I think it's really important to think about that, especially now, today. Um, and, um, and this is like my philosophizing about that, and then also about what makes better businesses, or, or what is like, if you, if you forgot about all the things that everybody says you should do when you do a business, what would be the best way to build a business? Like if you would forget about, you know, all the, all the common truths and best practices and, and everything that people think that is just you know, they take for granted when you, when you start a business. Um, how would you build it to make it more about the people than about uh, necessarily you know, uh, business? Uh, because businesses ultimately are there to feed us and not the other way around. And, and this is what the session is about. It's a lot of expectations, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> but I think, like to come back to that question, why has Drupal been successful? I think it's because of this. It's because of collaboration and generosity. It's because um, uh, in this community, we haven't been afraid to share freely with the people that might be our competitors, actually, that might be um, also be able to take the job and do it instead of you. And it's that generosity, um, 
uh, that is incredibly important, uh, and, and it's collaboration. I think without generosity and collaboration, there's no community. Then you get these, you know, yeah, the, this, uh, my car is bigger than yours. I was going to say something else, but <laughs> uh, the, my, my car is bigger than yours communities um, where, where people are just like boasting like, how are you? Oh, great. It's fantastic. <laughs> and, and actually, it's not going that well. Or, or like this, this blind boasting. And I've seen a lot of places that are like that. I've been to conferences where um, there's no generosity. There's no vulnerability. There's no uh, cooperation or community. It's um, I need to stand out and I need to be better than everybody else. And this was not the case in the Drupal community, or at least for a very long time. And I think that's, that's, that's the, the core and the heart of why we've been successful. Um, I, it feels to me a little bit like there's been a phase shift and that we've, we've um, to some extent, this has become less so. Maybe not at this conferences, uh, but I've seen uh, some places where it becomes a lot more about competition, and and that really you know saddens me, because um, for for me the Drupal community was like a, a second home for a very long time, where with lo a lot of friends that I might not really know, but still we're friends, <laughs> and we're we're working together and, and doing stuff together. And I think that the reason is because there was abundance. Like as long as the, as long as there was like infinite markets and there was infinite growth and there was no there was no reason to really compete, even if you were operating in the same markets, even if you were like potentially going to be uh, doing the job that somebody else was doing, there was enough work. There was no need. There was no need to compete because there was abundance. There was enough for everybody, and you didn't have to be worrying about, am I going to be able to pay the bills? Am I going to be able to pay my employees? Am I going to have to fire somebody? Right? These are um, like if you're an entrepreneur or if you're a founder, um, uh, like this, this is horrible. If you ha ever have to have that moment when um, there's not enough and you're like forced with like, you know, do we do a Hail Mary and hope for the best? <laughs> and, and that maybe, you know, project is going to come in next month or, or should I be firing somebody? It's very, very tough. Um, so now I think, what, and I have the feeling that at least for a short blip in, in our community, around the time when Drupal 8 was not coming out, we had this lack of abundance. And suddenly it became about competition. Uh, also, a lot of people have been coming into our community that don't care about cooperation and collaboration that are there to extract as much as they possibly can. And, um, and, and they were destroying the abundance that we have. Um, and that's why I think, personally, that Drupal Drama is just a symptom. Um, uh, Drupal Drama, I, I, everybody knows about this, I hope? Or anybody does know what it is? Uh, so there's, um, it's a very touchy thing. <laughs> Um, but there was, um, there was a conflict about uh, uh, um, a core community member who, um, who turned out to be having like a, a secret life, and then that was out outed. And I'm trying to formulate it very carefully be because I don't want to take a position in this. Um, uh, I feel very sad about it because um, it's been destructive for everybody. Um, it hasn't given anybody anything. I think it's just, you know, and there's some people that are not at this conference that might have been in this session that otherwise would have been here, uh, except for this. So, um, but read up on it if you're interested. Um, uh, but basically, I, I personally think this is just a symptom because I have seen people, some of my friends that I know now for 10 years, that were these amazing, generous people. And now I see them at the conference and they have this aggression phase, this phase where um, like they're really competing and it's not nice anymore. And, and that really, really saddens me. Um, uh, now, 
if you're new to the community, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I, um, uh, I, 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 there's still a lot of really good things in our community, and um, um, this doesn't have to be a defining feature. And the session is actually there because I hope that we can step over this. And I think it will teach us a lot uh, that if we, if we um, reflect on this together, that we can learn a lot about what has made our success and how we are going to perpetuate it and renew it. Um, so, but I believe that the real reason be for what is happening is this, is that um, there's competitive behavior that's been introduced into our community where um, uh, some people believe that competition is like great, that it's a good idea to compete, um, and, and this has created scarcity. Now, I'm not saying that competition is bad. Competition has a function, and it's important. But I think that it has to be very, very carefully balanced. Because if it's done, if, if, we, if we get a red ocean community, which is all about competition, we cannot collaborate. Then it all falls apart. And, um, and I think that the, the, the importance of competition has been overvalued. And there are certain practices, competitive practices, that have been brought into our community um, um, by influence from investors, to some extent, I think, and by, by people that came into our community because they saw the abundance that we had and wanted a piece of it. And that, that are basically, um, and these practices are, are infectious because when somebody starts, like for example, headhunting from other companies, like you could say, like it's a good thing for the individual developers, to some extent. So to some extent, you need some movement, and 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 that's natural. But when you set somebody, when you make it somebody's job to go and find out what it's going to take to get somebody to to join your company instead of somebody else's company, um, you're creating an atmosphere where you can't have events like this, because because now you're afraid as an owner, like is somebody going to give an offer to my employees? that I cannot match. And then maybe my project is going to fail because I don't have enough people and my whole business can fail. And I, I'm not saying that you know, people should be bound to one company, not at all. But when, when it's all about competition in the first place and it's like, like you know, come on guys, let's go for it. <laughs> That's not okay. And I think um, um, because this creates this phase shift in the mentality of the community. So isn't there another way? That's my question. Um, and um, so I've interspersed this with a few videos. I hope it will work. Uh, <laughs> the um, uh, the Wi-Fi should be OK, but um, this, I hope the sound will work. Again, this is very, like, how am I doing? You're still following? This is OK? Because I'm going off a cliff, <laughs> so uh, okay. If 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 it gets too philosophical or too fly fly, let me know. Okay. So um, well, <laughs> and to test that, <laughs> this this uh, this um, presentation by Terence Deacon. He's the author of of one of the books that I recently read, that I think um, that I'm reading to better understand this problem space. Do you think that the scientific dualism of Descartes is part of the problem that um, we can't seem to, to get a grasp of the extent that we're, we're changing the environment and uh, we have a technology that's out of control? Um, putting, putting the human experience back into uh, the scientific worldview would somehow um, help to address the problem. So I think people have all along been trying to do that. We recognize that the um, hard sciences, quote, view of the world leaves value out, leaves meaning out. And of course, that's what we're missing in this whole process. Um, and yet, um, just trying to marry them back together has failed. We really can't say, OK, let's put a little mind in here, and then machines over here, and the, the mind and machine will interact. We don't understand what the relation is between the mind stuff and the physical stuff. And that's what gets us into trouble, I think. Uh, Descartes really 
created the conditions for the modern scientific view to take off. And to separate out the mental, the experiential, the value um, from the mechanistic made it possible for us to explore the mechanistic systematically and to build up to where we are now. But that truce that was set up, that sort of um, peaceful coexistence in which you never talk about mind if you're in the physical sciences, and you never really worry about physics or even biology if you're in uh, social sciences or even in psychology in many cases. Um, that division is a problem because without understanding how those things work out, um, we just simply are letting one run on its own, independent of the other. And we, of course, constantly talk about values. We constantly talk about the value of the ecosystem, the value of each species, the value of diversity, those sorts of things. But mostly it's, it's in terms of, well, with respect to me. Um, will I be less happy if I don't have these things? Will my children have a harder time of it if uh, the ecosystem uh, gets hotter and hotter and hotter. Um, we worry about that, but we don't have a sense of how value comes into the world. Wow. So I talked about the Drupal problem, but I think this is part of a much bigger problem. I think that's, um, I, I call myself a scientist. I got a, scientist, a scientific degree. Uh, I'm a bioengineer. Um, and um, like I, I, I love, I love books that, or I love um, explanations that take like a step-by-step -step approach and that uh, don't like jump stages that that's, um, really explain things. So I, this, this is why I think this session <laughs> might not be <laughs> a perfect fit for that. But that, that kind of scientific mind is something that you see everywhere in the world. And it's the scientific mind that brought us uh, the money, um, the business ecosystem that we have, um, that, that is very materialistic. Um, and I think I, I recently, well, so I'm, I'm still progress, uh, processing all of this stuff because it's um, like this guy writes really interesting, very complicated books. Uh, and I'm still trying to figure out his last one. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but um, he, what he here talks about in this interview is that there's like this split that we've made between um, caring and like meaningfulness and purposefulness and the material world and the things that keep us alive. So we've, we've made a split and we've made this, and because we understood the material thing much, much better than the caring and the meaningfulness and the purposefulness part, we've basically made a split and this part here, this material part has been developing like crazy. Like uh, the whole um, economical economy, like the whole economy, the, the money system, um, uh, business and so on, um, has developed massively to extract an enormous amount of, of material wealth, unprecedented, fantastic, beautiful, amazing. But we've forgotten about purpose, we've forgotten about being human, about, about connection, about the things that make it worth living. And you see this problem everywhere. You see it in how we're treating the environment, you see it in uh, suicide rates, you see it like in, in the drudgery, in the, the, the meaninglessness of, of, of life of so many people. Um, and, and I think we are about on the cusp of um, getting a much better understanding of the meaningful part of, of that part of life. And I think it's really, really urgent time because if we don't, we're gonna have problems like what we had in the Drupal community where we had this fantastic thing that somehow magically worked and then we started to make it more scientific and started to like figure out how can we extract more value out of it and it all goes to hell. Right. So, but what, what is, what is um, so I, as I said, like I think the reason is because we've been focusing on this competition part and I, you know, I, um, I believe in this stuff, so I'm not, um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, I, I believe in, in uh, natural selection and all of that stuff. But I think the problem is that we've been focusing too much on the selection part. We've been focusing completely on competition. Like all of our science, this, this has uh, been so influential in our, in our uh, worldview. Like everybody, unless you're um, living somewhere in the US, maybe, <laughs> 
everybody believes that natural selection is how species evolved, or most people. Um, and there's and it's been become so much part of how we think about living, uh, like competition. It's all about competition. Um, and science is, is this, been, this has become such an important aspect of science that we've forgotten about the cooperation part. I know in the last decades, we've started to see that there's this other aspect of life, uh, symbiosis, where uh, animals live together or, or where living organisms live together. And the more and more that I'm, I'm, I'm learning about symbiosis, um, it's everywhere, it's insane. Every single cell in your body has mitochondria. Mitochondria are a bacteria that we absorbed a few million years ago. Like when, when multicellular life evolved, um, that was only possible because of mitochondria. Every single cell of you only exists because of symbiosis. And that's just the start. Your, your, your gut is full of bacteria. Your skin is full of bacteria. Your gut is lined with a slime um, that, um, that contains viruses that protect you from your bacteria. And, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. Everywhere you look, there's symbiosis, there's collaboration and cooperation. And all we've been looking at is competition. And I think when you look at the world from a competition view, and, you've, and you're only thinking about how can I extract as much as possible for myself, then you throw away all the possibilities of symbiosis. You throw away most and the most important aspect of life, I believe. Because I don't like living in a world of competition. I don't like having to fight every day and being worried about what's going to happen. I like sharing and collaborating and, and working with other people. So these are, these are a few books that I've been reading um, that, that deepen this understanding. Like these last two, that's from the guy who was just speaking. Um, the symbolic species talks about how language actually is an organism. How language is just like us, kind of like um, um, an, an evolving um, and, and like uh, an organism against which there is selection pressure, so there's competition. But um, it's evolving in, in uh, cooperation with us. Language is the thing that makes us think, and that enables us to think, and it like, fills a gap in humans and it's like perfectly fit for us, but it's really complicated, so I'm, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Super interesting, but be warned, it's hard. Um, Incomplete Nature is a, a book about how you can go from a thermal vents in the bottom of the ocean to life, including explaining why we have sexes, why um, we have only two sexes, why we are mortal, um, how we grow, uh, why we live a certain length of time, and, and so on and so on. It's a fantastic book. That's, um, sorry, that's the vital question. Um, Incomplete Nature is about, um, like, it's like a thermodynamic explanation of life. It's super hard, um, but um, yeah, really, really interesting. But all three of these books for me tell me over and over and over again that like, we've, we've been overlooking the most important aspect of, of life because we take it for granted. Um, because we don't see, we, we don't have to be afraid of it. It's like, um, it's like with news. Why do we only get the bad news, right? It's because that's what fascinates us, because that's where the danger is. Although that most of life is not bad news, it's good news. But we're completely fascinated with the bad stuff. And by being, by our, through our fascination, we're actually be, becoming more and more geared towards competition. So we, we have to like open our worldview and see the good stuff. So, <laughs> for, for people that just joined, but I'm sure you already knew that this was not a migration session. Um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> um, this is me going off the cliff into the philosophical waters, so be warned. Um, the, um, let's dive down a little bit in business. H anybody read these books or one of them? Yeah? No? Okay. So, if you want to build a business, this is a good place to start. But these are, are 
when you read these, um, these are all books that talk about how if you want financial independence, you have to create a machine that will work instead of you. This is how financial independence works. You, you create wealth, you create assets that are going to be working instead of you so that you don't have to work anymore. And then you can do other stuff. Probably you'll still be working, but you'll have the freedom to do whatever you want. This is, this is the, the promised land of capitalism, right? Problem is, one thing that you see once you start reading, like rich dad, poor dad, there's this uncomfortable truth in there where he's, he talks about the people that work for him in one of these companies. Uh, like it's, a, it's an older lady who's working in a supermarket. And it's not clearly expressed, but there's that really big uncomfortableness of, I'm getting freedom at your cost because you're going to be giving your time in perpetuation forever, like just working for a wage so that I can be free. And I don't know about you, but it makes me very uncomfortable. Right? And this is, this is how it works. Um, it's all about building machines where there's people inside that are working so that you can be free. That's, that's what co uh, capitalism is about. Um, now, it's not necessarily bad because you're taking a bunch of risks, you're creating value, you're doing a lot of good things. But there's a very big uncomfortable truth in there that um, I think, yeah, I, I think we need to keep evaluating. Um, and especially in a world like today where there's so much abundance, where there's so much automation, we should be thinking like, is it really necessary to do this extractive thing? Can't we do it differently? Um, Next, um, these two books, Depth to a 5,000 Year History. In this book, um, what I learned from that was how did money start? Like, where does it come from? And he talks about how there's this thing when you, when you go to Economics 101, they start with, imagine you have a cow and some other guy has a chicken and, uh, um, and they need to trade. And like, and that doesn't work because a cow is much bigger than a chicken. And, and like, so, you know, you need something to be able to exchange. And it's like, oh yeah, 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 that makes a lot of sense. And everybody's like, yeah. But actually, if you really think about it, that's, um, that's not how real relationships work. In your family, you're not doing that. You're giving freely. You expect something will come back but you are giving freely um, as long as you can feel that that relationship is there. With your nearest neighbors, probably you're also not doing this. Um, your friends, you definitely don't do this. Um, money is a tool for enabling anonymous transactions. Money is a tool that resolves relationships. It's a tool that says, we're done, we're good, we're fine. There's no more debt towards me anymore. I've given you something, you've given me something back, we're good. And that's super powerful because it enables much more people to collaborate with each other. But at the same time, it's incredibly dehumanizing because it takes away the thing in relationships that makes relationships human, which is this, this information that is there in every relationship you hold about this other person that you've been interacting with. And it's that information that is actually providing value to our lives. Because even if you do things for money, there's always some residual information left. I'm, I'm working in this really awesome company that's trying to change the world, right? And you get money, but the thing that's really important for you is not the money, it's the, 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 the value, the, the, the thing you're doing for the community, for the world. So, and I, I think um, what, what he explains in this book is that money was originally created as um, a tool by, by kings so that they could pay their armies, right? Because they needed a way to uh, extract money, uh, extract value from their population, tax them, and then be able to pay for, for certain services. Uh, Homo Deus is also a really interesting book. It talks about um, intersubjective realities and, uh, well, but money is an intersubjective reality. It's something we invented to enable uh, certain, certain behavior. 
So and I think the core thing to, to learn from this is that money has this extractive side. It's a, it's a tool to extract from others. Um, uh, it's a zero sum thing. What you have, I don't have. Right? And, and if I want to get it, I need to somehow get it out of you. Um, and um, I, 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 I strongly recommend all three of these books. <laughs> um, because that's not the only way we can interact with people. Um, uh, when, you, when you have a money transaction, it's a finite game. It's, um, um, we do something, we, we interact with each other, and it finishes. And I have, have, I, who here has played a cooperative game? Yeah, cooperative games. You know what that is? So cooperative games are, um, you know, like most games, like board games, when you play board games, um, you're trying to win from the others, right? It's about becoming the winner, yeah. <laughs> And cooperative games, uh, they turn it upside down. They say, no, 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 we're fighting together, and we need to, we need to win together, because else we're going to lose together. And it completely changes the dynamic. Cooperative games, um, just like infinite games, are, are dances. It's like, um, it's like a dance, an interaction that keeps going and going and going. And, both, and everybody who's involved in it tries to keep the game going. Because it's fun, it's interesting, it's what gives meaning to our lives. Most meaningful things are, are infinite games. There are things where there is no winner or loser. There's, there's a, a build-up of interaction, of, of communication. And Finite and Infinite Games talks about that. Like, what is the difference? Um, it talks about titles, entitlements, and, and all those things, and why they are side products of finite games and, and why that is not always good. Um, Nonviolent communication, definitely read that stuff. The Anatomy of Peace is um, one of my favorite books because um, have you ever been in a relationship with, uh, with someone where either of you is like the dominant one and the other one is the submissive one? And, I, oh, I, and I'm saying this in a very abstract way. Like, um, if you're, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just realizing that I'm heading off the cliff. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase. Typical sitcom relationships, right? Um, stupid ass husband uh, is lazy, doesn't do what he's supposed to do, and, uh, and he has a wife who's like completely out of, her he out of her head, like angry and upset because this stupid ass person doesn't do what they're supposed to do, right? You know this kind of thing, the, the sleuth thing, right? Yeah? Yeah, for example, right. Now, this book explains how those kind of relationships, they call it collusion, are something where both parties are maintaining this kind of relationship. Uh, it's super, super interesting. If you're uh, in a long-term relationship, you need to read this stuff because it, it explains how you can um, avoid getting into that kind of uh, relationship. What it shows is that, because often what you see is there's this aggressive person who's horrible and then there's poor person who's like the victim of that aggressive person. Now, I'm saying this with a lot of trepidation again because there are certain people that seek to victimize people, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people want an equal relationship, but end up in a, um, an aggress aggressor-victim relationship. That's, and it's not always the case. Some people abuse the system. But um, in a healthy relationship, even in healthy relationships, this can happen. And it's basically because you're, you're, you're in a symbiotic relationship, and you're pushing each other to the polar opposites. And you keep pushing and pushing, and, and um, you, you end up in like this really distorted relationship. Anyway, read it. It's worth it. Um, but what, what you can get from this, what I wanted to bring up here, is that loser-winner games are finite games. It's not good to be the winner. Because to be, for you to be the winner, somebody has to have lost. 
And that's a really sad thing. The people you dance with, the people you live with, the people you interact with, you don't want them to be losers. That's not good. So why, why would we build our, why would we make this, this the, the, the core and the basis of our society? Right? Um, <clears throat> and there's, there's a third way. It doesn't always have to be about winning and losing. There's, there's a way to, to create a game that never ends. It's like competition. In competition, in, in a, a predatory world, you eat the prey and it's over. It's done. In a cooperative world, you interact with the other and you both benefit and you keep benefiting forever. And, you never, and it never ends. It's a dance that never ends. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's a thing that is meaningful in life. Next. <laughs> so these are all books that I've been reading and, and um, I, I read a lot of this stuff. Um, these three books, I first I read Cool uh, and there was uh, that started, for me, started to open the world for um, a post-hierarchical worldview. I've always lived kind of like that because I, I've never liked winning. No, I do like winning, but I don't like other people losing because I'm winning. Like, I don't want to be the one who causes somebody else to lose. Cool talks about um, hierarchical society. And it talks about how um, some like a few decennia ago, suddenly there was this shift because it used to be that society was super hierarchical, like there was like one hierarchy. And then these subcultures emerged where everybody could have like their own leader, be, be the leader of their own little turf. And you didn't have, like it didn't really matter if you were like on the bottom of the, of the, of the you know, the money pyramid or the, the power pyramid, it didn't matter because you could be like the coolest kid in the block because in, in, I don't know, like um, post stamp collections, you know, you were, you were the, the winner or you, you were like the one person who knew everything about this one small subject. And, and it's, it's this idea that uh, the creation of all these different hierarchies uh, outside of this one large hierarchy that's, that's all around us in society, that um, suddenly um, allowed more freedom and happiness for a lot more people. Because uh, it doesn't really matter where you are in, this, in the top hierarchy, because you can be in your own little hierarchy. What I think it really explains is how we're going from a hierarchical society to a network society, where we're all connected with each other, and there's nobody really on top. Like, on individual top subjects, you can be the leader, uh, and, you, and, and everybody can, like, there, there is place for everybody to feel good and to take leadership. It doesn't have to be one person who is like the leader. And I think that's, that's a really powerful insight that, that I'll elaborate further on in the rest of, uh, of my slides. Now, uh, the book on the left, Tribal Leadership, this is a really interesting thing that um, really influenced my thinking. Um, in this book, they talk about five stages that people can be in. The world stinks. My life stinks. I'm great. We are great. And the world is awesome. <laughs> and uh, people move, like, normally one stage at a time through this progression. So the people that are in the world stinks, they're not really nice to work with because they're um, plagued with addiction. Um, they, they can't really get anything done. They're uh, self-destructive. Uh, they, they basically, yeah. If you, if you want to work with them, you have to get them into, uh, my life sucks. But, you know, overall, there's a, there's a way out. There's a possibility. That first phase, that's nihilism. And I've met uh, when... when um, I, I was in a garage. How are we doing on time? Um, okay, good. Um, I, was in the, I went to my garage to change my tires, and it was just after Trump won. And, or, or, or I, I think it might have been Brexit. And I, I, I talked with this guy, and I was like, you know, I'm, re I'm still shocked. 
because like, you know, the world is going <laughs> to hell in a basket. And, and, and he's like, oh yeah, I would have voted for him. It's like, why? Well, the world's, you know, it, it all doesn't matter anyway. It's bad anyway. So, you know, we might as well just throw a dog in it and like see how it goes. And like, why? And he was in the world sucks. He was in the world, sorry, in the world sink, stinks. Um, second phase, my life stinks, which is where um, people know that the world could be nice, but they're convinced that for them it just doesn't work. And, and I think you probably know a lot of people in this space. If you have a hierarchical community, like a hierarchical business, like a government, you find a lot of these people. Um, they have a boss who's, who's in the, I'm great, but you're not, you know, the next stage. And that boss is constantly pushing them down so that they cannot, they cannot grow, they cannot really develop. And they're like, and um, like if, you, if you look around, like hospitals often have this, like uh, the doctors often are in, uh, I'm great, but you're not, right? You see, sometimes you see this in presenters. I don't know if you've seen this. Or people that are uh, writing blog posts. We're so great, and like you should just hire us because you're never going to figure this out. <laughs> right? I, uh, we, we, in our business, we have a, a rule. In Pronovix, we have a rule that um, uh, a blog post needs to be vulnerable and generous. Meaning, uh, generous, like you have to give something. You can't just say, we know everything and just come to us. Second, you have to be vulnerable. You have to show that we don't know everything. That there's um, not that we're stupid or that we're we're bad, or but you have to show that we also had to learn this or that we're still learning. And and the the reason why that is is because I I don't want us to be a we are great and you're not kind of place. Anyway, next step is we are great but they are not, which is um, you know. Uh, like an in-group fighting against another one. This is where Drupal used to be. We're great, and Joomla is horrible. Like, you know, Joomla, if you, if you said Joomla on a photo shoot, uh, like when we do the group photo, everybody's laughing. Uh, or WordPress, the same thing. Um, and, and we are great, and they are not, is a pretty good place to be. Um, like when, if you read tribal, tribal leadership, you'll see that he, uh, they talk about how they thought that there were these four phases, that it stopped that we are great and they're not. And, and then they found out that there's these other groups that are like completely beating everything, that are way more productive and that don't, that don't have this tribalism. And they were the, the world is great. And, you know, whatever, it's great, just share it around. It's, we don't have to fight against anybody because, you know, we're... We're just doing our stuff, and it's awesome. And uh, what they were mentioning is that the world is great is the place where most innovation happens, where the really interesting stuff happens. So now, um, I think I, I talked like a short recap. I talked about hierarchical relationships, like cool. And I talked about how we can go from a hierarchy to a multidimensional power uh, system. Where, like, which is more like a network where we're, we're connected with each other and where we're not striving to be the one who's smarter and better than the others. Like um, where we show our vulnerability and the things that we still have to learn while we are proud of the things that we've already achieved. Right? We're not saying like, I don't know anything, I'm just stupid. And It's not that. It's saying, I know quite a few things, but I don't know everything. I've, I've, I've done a lot of thinking and a lot of learning, and here's what I've learned. You can also learn this because, you know, I'm not better than you. I've just spent more work and effort, and you can also do this. Go, go, go. That's a community where, um, where everybody's growing and where you're not, like, pushing down, like, well, uh, yeah, I mean, blah, 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 blah. code sample, and you don't understand anything of this, but, you know, I'm just so much smarter than you. <laughs> um, so that's that's... The difference. So I think that um, multidimensional power is something we should be striving for as a community. Um, but let's, well, no, no, I'll do that later. Yeah. Now, 
<coughs> go back to this one. The book on the right, Reinventing Organizations, this is the, the Thiel book. Um, it's by Frédéric Laloux. He's um, a Belgian, <laughs> like me. <laughs> and I'm not saying that we're great and you're not. But, <laughs> um, uh, but um, he, he, he used to work at McKinsey, and he was fed up. Because he looked around him, and he saw this drudgery and, and this, yeah, people just hating their work and, and a bunch of crap. And then uh, like I'm, I'm saying it's much shorter, and he's got a much better explanation. I, I got a short video of him later. Um, and he, he wrote uh, Reinventing Organizations, which is a book about how to become teal. And I'll explain it in a moment. But basically what that book is about is that, uh, and it, it, there'll be a video about it also, um, he sees five types of organization that he, he uh, calls out. You got red. They're the impulsive. Uh, there's, um, you know, the boss just because I tell you so, just do it. Don't even think. And and the boss has to keep watching his back because maybe there'll be somebody like stabbing in the back, and uh, <laughs> and trying to take over power. This is like a red organization. It's like competition everywhere. I, it, it's it's competition to the extreme. Uh, you can't trust anybody. Um, Amber is, um, is like um, uh, the way a lot of churches work. It's, um, um, they have processes. That's just, how the, that's just the way we do things. It's, uh, don't even question it. This is how it works. Um, they're, um, and I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just do a short introduction, and you'll see the video. Um, Orange is achievements. It's like, this is most multinationals today. We have earned it. We're worth it. Um, we're, we think about it scientifically, and we're looking for the biggest profit. Um, uh, green is um, um, <laughs> we all need to make sacrifices. I, and now, uh, a short intermezzo here again. So this is the intermezzo presentation. <laughs> so I have been very troubled because I didn't want to run an orange. Well, I, amber and reds, I don't want, I'm like, don't even think about that. But I also didn't want to run an orange, an orange organization. I didn't want to run a purely rational organization that's all about money and, and objectives and, um, you know, are you, are you fulfilling your quota and that kind of stuff. I didn't want to do that. Uh, but I also didn't want to run a green organization where, um, like, there's a big mission. And, like, we have to... And I'm saying this, again, with a lot of trepidation, but like uh, Greenpeace. We have to save the world, so like, go and destroy all the businesses. But well, it's not like that, but, but it's, it's this sacrifice. We have to make a personal sacrifice, because if we don't do this, it's not going to work, and, and the world is going to go to hell. And yes, the world is going to go to hell if we don't do something, but I don't think that making personal sacrifices and, and like destroying yourself as a martyr is the answer. And, like, and I, I, I felt I was completely confused and I felt really bar bad and, and uncomfortable about this until I read Reinventing Organizations, where they explained that like there's, there's these two answers and I don't agree with any of these two. I think the real answer is, is this win, 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 win. Like, it should be good for business, but it should also be community. It should be good for nature also. It, like, we don't have to sacrifice, um, uh, we don't have to sacrifice profits so that we can save the world. And we also don't have to sacrifice the world so that we can make profit. I think the, the real path is somewhere in the middle. And I think Teal is, is more or less that. But, um, so I think the, the key for me from this was um, going from money is all that counts over sacrifice everything <laughs> for one purpose, like figure one purpose. Like, yeah, this, this is like one of the advices you often hear is um, you need to find a purpose. And like, okay, I'm, I'm and, and then I, I like, we're, we're going to do documentation. We're going to be, you know, we're going to make the world a better documented place. It's like, 
gag when I <laughs> think about it now. Um, but but this is what often is 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 used is like pick one thing and then go f completely for it. And um, I don't I don't think that's that's the right way. I think doing good by doing well is is a much better path. Anyway, um, short. Maybe we should like all stretch <laughs> because this is a long. Uh, like go ahead. So short discussion. Um, can you think back to one of these patterns? Have you seen this? I, I don't know. Do you want to discuss this? We could try maybe. Um, have you ever been in touch with a company where you're like, they're different? It doesn't work. Like their their way of thinking is just wrong. And I, I can I, maybe I can work with them, but it's like um, or maybe l l this is the easiest one. Do you know someone who makes you feel like your life stinks? Can you say, can you think about, and, and maybe you can abstract it so that you don't have to say one thing. Can you think about a presentation that you felt, that you've been into, that made you feel like you're just stupid? Have you had that? Anybody? I'm sure you have. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, right? OK. I tried this in the company, and it didn't work. <laughs> the discussions, uh, apparently, <laughs> it's not, I need to rethink this part. But, um, um, but well, just a short recap. Can you, can you all think of someone who Who's, who's in this, the world stinks. Do you know someone like that? I know people. Yeah. Who knows people that are, my life stinks? Yeah. I'm sure everybody, right? Yeah. I'm great. Yeah. Um, we are great. Do you know companies like that? Yeah. Or people or groups? And then the world is great. Have you seen that? Because that's the harder one. Yeah. OK. Um, do you know in your neighborhood uh, red communities? Meaning like, I need to be watching out because somebody's going to like stab me in the back and I'll be out. You know communities like that? I know, I know one person. It's like mafia, right? The mafia is like that. Um, Amber? Um, well, I'll, I'll skip the rest. The, uh, yeah. uh, so, um, more books, and I'll, I'll cut here, but um, the, I, I think what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is, so how can we go to win, win, win? How can we um, borrow from nature and go towards um, collaboration and symbiosis rather than competition. Um, how can we, yeah, how, how can we, like, because this is the other thing, is often you'll see companies, uh, this is especially in venture-backed companies, or like, you know, where there's a, um, a, 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 s a stakeholder that's only there for the money, right? When you have those, then you get this environments where, um, Extracting as much money as possible from the customer is like the primary goal. And everything else is, is secondary. It's all about extraction. Um, and I personally think that that's a bad idea. Because if you extract as much as possible, and that's the primary goal, then you forget about making sure they're winning. You forget about um, you're, you're sacrificing a lot of things. Now, um, here comes the, the teal pit. Like, so who has heard of holacracy? Okay, who has heard of Teal? The same group, a few, yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to show a little video from Frédéric Laloux, who's, um, who's a guy who wrote Reinventing Organizations, and then after that, I'm going to show an introduction of the five uh, types of, of uh, higher, like, organizations. Um, let's see. 
A lot of philosophers and historians and anthropologists have looked back at these big leaps in thinking in human history. And they all agree on the, you know, the big steps that we've had. There were one or two steps before that, but at some point we went from small bands to you know, larger tribes, and that was a big step up in you know, the human journey. And then there was the agrarian revolution, a whole different world. That's when we started trusting authority and you know, you know, trusting for 2,000 years that women have fewer teeth than men. That's, um... And then there was another shift you know, to, to the scientific you know, mindset, to the, the industrial age, where we started counting. And you know, for a few decades, we've been entering this postmodern information world with, again, our thinking changing. And now there's something new that seems to be emerging. Many people write about it. There isn't yet a term that has really made it. You know, maybe you, some people call it the integral age or the holistic age or the authentic age. Um, we'll see which, which term sticks. And what we know is that at each of these steps, we reinvented everything. We made a step up in technology. We changed. Uh, the politics fundamentally, economics changed, right, went from hunting and gathering to agriculture to industry. And one thing that has been mostly overlooked is that we fundamentally at each stage invented a new management paradigm, a new way to run organizations. Right? And so the notion that we might do this again doesn't sound quite so crazy if you just look, you know, this has happened four or five times in the past. You know, this will only be the fifth time, you know, that we will do kind of a major step up. Okay. I'll quickly run you through, you know, the first steps to give you a, a sense of these changes. And then we'll spend most of the time discussing, you know, about what I found out from these extraordinary organizations that already operate kind of at this new emerging stage. Okay. The very first organizations were very crude. There were people from one tribe temporarily gathering under their chief to go out and fight the neighboring tribe, submit them, and make slaves. Okay, very crude organizations. You know, no strategy of sides, no flip chart meetings. You know, just go out there, you know, make slaves. And what is interesting is that today there are still some organizations that run along pretty much these principles, which are street gangs, mafias, mercenary armies. So how do these organizations operate? Um, basically, they're very small, pretty unstable, and the boss has to constantly inspire fear in the people below him, really physical fear, because if he shows the slightest sign of weakness, somebody will come from the back and backstab him to try and take his place. So very, very informal, very, very much fear-based. And so, you know, the, the metaphor, if you want to think about these organizations, is they're really like wolf packs, right? You have the alpha wolf, you know, that always projects power until he gets old and then a younger wolf comes and, you know, and kills him. And then came, came 5,000 years ago, the agrarian revolution. And the agrarian world is a very different world. It's not just a world of power, it's a world of rules. Right? All agrarian um, civilizations um, started to have institutionalized religion, so you know, God-given rules. They, started, they all are highly stratified caste systems or you know, very strong social hierarchies. And the organizations they invented um, are very much different from these ones. So the typical organization of that time is, is the Catholic Church. Right, as maybe the archetypical organizations, armies. Most government agencies today and public school systems are run in that way. So these are highly hierarchical, highly stable organizations. Um, and compared to the previous ones, they came up with two extraordinary breakthroughs. The first one is they invented the formal hierarchy, they invented the org chart, the boxes. Uh, skip here. Uh, just like I wanted to give you like the the, the basic idea and like this this the wolf pack. Uh, sorry, I wanted to give you the the wolf pack um, uh, metaphor. Let's say like to, because he really explains it well. But he goes on for another hour, so there's not enough time. Um, but um, there's a. Oh. 
There's this one. This presentation is um, is faster. <laughs> so, I'll, oh, uh, and I'll go even skip the introduction. Paradigms have emerged over the centuries that unlocked new levels of prosperity as they became the predominant approach. In this video, we'll take a look at these paradigms, then examine how they can inform our thinking about adopting agile or lean approaches. Each new paradigm is described by its own color, has some unique characteristics, and some breakthrough ideas. And we'll look at some examples of organizations operating under each paradigm today. We will start with the oldest paradigm, described by the color red. The guiding metaphor for red is that of the wolf pack. Red emerged as people organized into tribes and was the predominant paradigm for centuries. The defining characteristics of red include a powerful leader who inspires fear in the group's enemies and compliance within the group. Red is most useful in situations of chaos where the powerful leader may be the only thing guaranteeing the survival of the group. The breakthrough ideas of red are command authority where a leader can set a direction and people will follow allowing them to work towards a common goal, and division of labor, where people can specialize in a specific type of work that benefits the overall group. Examples of organizations functioning under the red paradigm today include the mafia, street gangs, and tribal militias. Red organizations are limited by the short-term perspective required to survive chaos. The next level, amber, evolved when the instability of fear-based power structures could not accomplish longer-term success. The guiding metaphor for AMBER organizations is that of an army. AMBER emerged as hierarchical patterns like those invented by the Roman military under Julius Caesar and those used by the Catholic Church, enabled focusing on long-term goals which are only possible under stable leadership, being based on status, not physical prowess. The primary characteristic of AMBER organizations is their strict hierarchical structure, leading to stability and exerting strong control over the lower levels in the hierarchy. The breakthrough ideas in an AMBER organization are taking a long-term perspective, instituting strong processes, and creating formal roles for various levels within the hierarchy. Examples of current organizations that have an AMBER perspective are most public schools in the United States, most governments, and traditional churches. AMBER organizations begin to hit their limits when conditions change that require new approaches. The next level, orange, evolved when entrenched AMBER organizations were unable to adapt to changing conditions. The guiding metaphor for orange is that of a machine. Orange emerged in the age of reason, along with the American and French revolutions, where individual meritocracy meant that the best ideas had a chance of competing regardless of an individual's status. The primary characteristics of orange organizations include competition within the organization and with other organizations, a focus on financial profit and growth, and a switch to objectives-based management, where leaders set the strategy and lower levels within the hierarchy are given some freedom in how to carry out the strategy. The breakthrough ideas in an orange organization are innovation, accountability for reaching the objectives laid out by management, and meritocracy, where individuals can rise within the organization based on their skill, intelligence, and creativity. Orange is the predominant perspective in the world today, and nearly all large corporations function from an orange perspective, as well as many public universities. Orange begins to hit its limits when people feel that the profit motive is not fulfilling enough, often becoming disengaged with the organization's view of them as cogs in a machine. A 2013 Gallup poll showed that only 30% of US workers were engaged at work, a strong signal of the limits of an orange perspective. The next level, green, has emerged as people have sought more meaning in their work. The guiding metaphor for green is that of the family. The primary characteristics of green organizations are a focus on delighting customers, making decisions based on a set of shared values, and high engagement from everyone in the organization. The breakthrough ideas are balancing the needs of all stakeholders, including customers, employees, partners, and shareholders for publicly held companies, a focus on culture over strategy, and true empowerment of members in the organization, regardless of their hierarchical level. Examples of organizations that have a green perspective are Southwest Airlines and Ben & Jerry's Ice Cream. 
The agile and lean movements also emerge from companies with this perspective. Green begins to hit its limits when consensus building results in overly slow decision making and the hierarchical structures still existent in green begin to conflict with people's desires to have greater autonomy. The next level, teal, is emerging as organizations have discovered how to work effectively without hierarchical structures. The guiding metaphor for teal is that of a living system. The primary characteristics of a teal organization are what are known as anti-fragile organizational structures, either flat or based on interlocking circles of evolving roles, aligning around an evolutionary purpose, some shared goal of making the world a better place, and by distributing decision-making authority to all members of the organization using something called the advice process, where any colleague can make any decision in the organization so long as they have sought the advice of anyone that that decision might impact. This differs from consensus in that not all advice must be heeded, just considered. The breakthrough ideas in Teal are wholeness, where people can bring their whole selves to work, their spiritual side, their intellectual side, and their creative side, and feel safe that they will not be judged for being themselves. Self-management is another breakthrough idea. In most Teal organizations, there are no managers, and an evolutionary purpose, meaning that the purpose is not owned by any one person, but evolves as new people join the organization and as the organization learns more about how it can make the biggest difference in the world. Examples of teal organizations include Patagonia, the outdoor clothing company, Morningstar, a tomato processing plant responsible for 40% of the tomato products in the United States, and Burtzorg, a 7,000 person home care nursing organization. Burtzorg. Agile and Lean are firmly rooted in green, and most of the struggles we see with adoption are in organizations whose leadership have a dominant orange perspective. To someone with an orange perspective, Agile and Lean are seen as simply process improvements to increase productivity, efficiency, or profits. But without adopting the cultural perspectives of green, only those practices that align with orange are adopted, and they are overlaid against orange approaches like top-down management or valuing profit against any other outcome. Agile thrives in organizations with a predominantly green perspective, and agile practices become almost overkill in a teal organization, which have evolved their own practices that include agile values, but where many agile practices are no longer required, for example, a single product owner. If you are currently part of an orange organization and are looking for ways to make it work better, search out others with a green perspective especially those in leadership positions, and work with them to help drive the cultural change required to make Agile work as it was designed. Lalo's research indicates that only the top leader in an organization can successfully transform it vertically, for example, from orange to green. However, horizontal transformation is possible, for example, working within the boundaries of orange to make it a more vibrant place of innovation and objectives-based management, instead of a stressful, lifeless place of micromanagement. One important concept is that one color is not necessarily better than any other. There are valuable ideas in every perspective. There is data that shows that the newer perspectives are better able to deal effectively with increasing levels of complexity and interconnectedness. But that does not mean that every situation requires this or that only green and teal organizations can be successful. Success is defined differently from each perspective. Also, the newer perspectives include the older ones, like a Russian nesting doll, so someone with a teal perspective can and should continue to use orange or amber ideas when they might best meet the needs of the organization. I hope this overview was helpful and that it gave you some insight into the culture of your organization. Reviewing agile and lean. So, um, the, was, this, uh, was this useful? Made it sense? Okay. So now you know what is teal. <laughs> um, I also know how, where to place it. I think it gave this video gives some answers about why Agile might be failing in your organization if you're trying to do Agile and it doesn't really work. Um, so it, it gives you... The, the, the most important thing I learned after reading this book was that um, best practices for one type of organization might not be the best practices for your organization. Like... Um, there's, these, there's certain best practices about people management and so on um, that, um, uh, that, that are perfect for orange organizations, but that don't work in teal, for example. It's really, really, really useful. Anyway, 
Now, this, was, this started about Drupal. So what does this have to do with Drupal? Because it's all about companies. Now, um, I realized, I came to a realization a, while, a little while ago that really, really surprised me. And that was that the Drupal community per se actually is steel. And the reason why um, I understood this was um, I was trying to organize this conference, API the Docs, uh, in uh, the Write the Docs community. It's like a community of um, people crazy about documentation. Yes, they do exist. Um, <laughs> so, and, um, and it was really, really weird because, um, like, f first of all, I, I thought, like, just the way that we do things in Drupal is like, oh, I want to do a conference. Let's do a conference. Like, let's do a conference for this community. So we started, like, organizing it. And suddenly, we, we were, like, approached by leadership, like, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, this looks like you're doing, like, something for your company. And that's not OK. And like, oh, that's weird. <laughs> like, we've been doing this all the time in Drupal. And it was never really a problem. And um, so it made me realize that um, the Drupal community has this crazy thing where anybody can just stand up and say, we're going to do an event. It's called Drupalathon. It's going to be awesome. Let's figure out, are there anybody, is there anybody else who wants to help? OK, great. Let's do it. And this, this, um, uh, this process is happening um, like all, of, all across the world. And it's, it's very distributed. And um, it, it's doing what's, what they said about Teal, that anybody can take a decision as long as they've uh, consulted with the people that the decision is going to have an effect on. But then everybody is just empowered to just go ahead and do that decision. And, and, and that, for me, was like, yeah, actually, Drupal is steel. Uh, Drupal also has this, um, um, you know, the world is great. Like, on the best moments, not always, but on the best moments, Drupal becomes like that, where the community becomes like that, where people are just having fun and innovating. And they're not really worrying about the others. They're, they're like completely forgot about the competition, or that, that doesn't really matter anymore. We're just doing awesome stuff. And, um, and I think that th those things are related to each other. Now, what can we practically do? I think first, the most, one of the most important things we need to do is that we need to make community first. And what I mean with that is um, that we need to become a community first community. You familiar with Django? They are awesome. I think in some cases, they're a lot more awesome than we are. Um, they have Django girls. They have, um, which, which is a, um, a series of events specifically for women uh, to make it so that women that want to learn to code don't need to feel um, 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 yeah, you know, afraid or too vulnerable or are looked at like from I'm great but you're not, and and so th that's one thing. But but it goes way 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 f further than that, and th they're not doing this just because you know, uh, giving equal opportunities to women is like a big thing in tech community right now. They're doing that because it's just part of their DNA. Um, they have um, um, they have this like j to to name one example. They have a clause in the way their leadership is structured is that every position, every role you take in the Django community automatically expires, after, I think, after two years, unless you prolong it. So if, you're, if you want to be like a core maintainer, um, you have to like explicitly say, I want to keep doing this. So it, it's like turning it from, a, you know, you're doing this like you're stuck with it. <laughs> Go, you know, keep going, keep going until it completely burned out. To, uh, are you okay? You still want to do this? Okay, let's do it. Um, also, the, their events, they're doing a lot of things. Like, um, I, I'm, I'm really happy for you to be here with your child. And thank, thank you for, <laughs> for, uh, for like, one of you being outside and, <laughs> and, and keeping it quiet. But I'm really, like, I think it's awesome. Uh, the, um, um, I know that some events, they've, they've organized crashes, for example. Like, for your child, it's, it's too early. But, um, but like, for example, I was at a WordCamp where they had, um, they had like, an actual crash. And they, were, they advertised it, like, come along, 
bring your kids. It's okay. There's somebody to take care of them. And um, like stuff like this. Now, as an organizer, I know that this is hard and that you can't always do this. Um, and it's expensive and, and there's not always the budget for it. But like I think this kind of mindset is, I think, important that we, we, need, to, we need to think about in, in, uh, in our community. Um, like there's a lot more, but <laughs> I think I'm 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 hit I'm getting close to uh, to my timeline. I think we need to think again about the design principles for the best possible community, and to make the community about the community and about being human and about taking care of each other uh, first, and and uh, and then the project will will flourish. Uh, the project will flourish if the people flourish. Um, if we make the people successful, uh, the project will be successful, I think. And we should never forget that. Um, so we'll skip through that. Um, there's some stuff, like this This was originally a presentation I did in our company about the kind of company I want, or I think we should be. Um, and um, um, I talked about like three big design principles that I think we need to have as our company. And like I tried to turn it into like design principles for community, but I don't know if it completely translates. But it might be useful if you're running a company. So like one is um, what is the for like do we I think we should challenge our assumptions. Like for about companies, for example. Um, what is the best possible company that you can make? to make everybody happy in your company. Like the people that are, like how can you make your, your business or your community about the people rather, on a, rather than about the, the, the profit or, or you know, the monetary goals? Um, how can we also like maximize our collective and, and individual resilience? So how can we make sure that, that if something bad happens that we're, we're ready for it and that we're, we're structured for it? How can we get to financial abundance? Because I think that is the core of, of any successful community or company. Um, I think we need to escape the zero-sum game. We cannot be competing for the same jobs. Now, that sounds like, okay, but so then should I just not compete? I'm not saying that. <laughs> they should, of course, try to make a living and, and to, to get projects. But how can you make it different? How can you make it so that you're serving an industry that's so different from everybody else, where you need such different ideas and knowledge, and uh, you need to meet so different people, that, um, that you become unmistakable, completely different? Um, uh, like, this is what we are doing. We're specializing in documentation systems. And um, yeah, it, it's a small market. Uh, uh, like if you do it globally, you know, there's there's good business, but any local market, it's not worth it. So you have to reorganize and, and do different things. Um, you need to go to different events. You need to do a bunch of other things. What is the market that you can identify where you can be completely unique, unmistakable, the best in the world? Today, and okay, uh, I say this with a lot of uh, trepidation again, <laughs> um, because I don't want to be, um, I don't want to do the, the I'm great and you're not thing. But today I say with some confidence that we are the world's best developer portal company, um, at, especially if you're looking for a CMS based system. And that's like, most people here have never heard of that term. <laughs> but, um, but so we've specialized hardcore on this one single area. And now we can say we're the world best because we've made the biggest investment. We've made crazy investments um, that nobody else would even think about doing because it's, it's such a crazy thing for a fairly small market. And, and we are successful because of that. Um, there's other things like um, what is enough? Yeah. So defining abundance, um, rather than like how to get as much as possible, how can you go to what is enough for you? If you have employees, talk with them about, or try talk to them about it. Like what would be enough for us? And how can we get there? 
Um, barn racing, like I've been thinking about how can we help each other? So like just the same way that uh, small communities do this. Um, um, instead of having to like go and pay a lot of money to build a house, they like come all together for a week and they, they raise a barn. They grow it together. So I'll skip through those things. Um, skip to that slide. Meaningful work. So how can we create a transformative community where we have flexible roles, where there's nonviolent communication, I think code of conducts are some part of it, but we need to be careful because if enforced the wrong way, that might actually become something bad also. Um, like, well, it's, yeah, it's tricky. It's, 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 I think we need to explicitly say, uh, like not allow um, violent communication, I think, in our communities and our spaces. And we need to protect everybody who, who comes to our events uh, and make everybody feel welcome. Uh, because unless we do that, we cannot have um, a vibrant community where everybody can, can find their own role. And um, yeah, I'll just skip through that. And the last part, um, resilience, is yeah, how, how, can we, how can we build a network of resilience so that even if things go bad, even if there's like a, a bad bump in the road, that we don't fail. And um, I think the last part, Wait, yeah, I had here, how, this is about how companies die, okay? A company dies because companies grow until they can't grow anymore. They stop innovating, they just scale. And then at some point, um, um, something happens, like a, an effect in the marketplace, which disrupts the marketplace, and then there's not em enough money anymore, so, so, you know, start firing, and you get into the spiral of death. And... Um, I think that if you know this, then maybe we can structure organizations also in a way that they won't die from small shocks or from big shocks even. There's a lot of ramblings. Final conclusion. Are you competing or collaborating? I want to ask you today, if you look back at the projects you're doing, are you competing or collaborating? How much are you competing? As a, as a company, maybe also as a person, right? And this is, this is a weird question, right? <laughs> but so, yeah, it de depends on the perspective, but um, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'm asking it more as like a takeaway. Think over it over lunch. Like really honestly think about it. Are you competing with the people here around you? Right? Maybe, maybe not. Some of us are, I'm sure. Um, and, like, and how could you be cooperating instead? If, you make it, if we all make it our first goal to be cooperating rather than competing, we're going to grow this community like crazy. If we start thinking about how can I eat his cheese or her cheese, then we're not going to keep growing. Then we're going to implode. I, I think the, the core message, and this has been my message for a few years now, how can you differentiate? How can you be different? How can you be so different that there's no need to compete? Because you're just, your, cost, your cost calculations are so different from everybody else. Most Drupal companies work the same. They have the same cost structures. They have got developers, they got designers, project managers. It's all the same. There's no difference. The only, the only difference might be that they'll have developers in, in uh, Hungary or, or, or an expensive place, and maybe the developers will be closer to them. But that's the only differentiation that they're doing. It's not enough. So on that note, um, there's a group photo, like, right now. <laughs> That's uh, the problem, I think. <laughs> um, after the session, and then tonight at 4.30, there's going to be a surprise. So you should not run away. You shouldn't go home. Uh, you should stay. I think that's the other message. So, um, and, um, yeah. I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> <Thanks. laughs>
<laughs> well, we'll do we'll do the like the yeah. <laughs> Thanks.